What's up, Charles? Oh, you're frozen, Charles. Oh man, your your signal just went to zero. <laughs> I don't know if you can even hear me, but yeah, your Wi-Fi signal or your phone thing is down to that much. What's up, everybody? Charlie, obviously, you guys all know if you're on Kauai, you know about the <clears throat> bad accident they had again at uh, by the halfway bridge. So Charlie is stuck in traffic, and he's operating off of his phone. But we were just chatting, and it was it was really really clear and crispy, and then it just went kaput. So I'm sure he'll get back on in a minute. Hope you guys are having a good week. It's Hump Day Wednesday. Aloha, Dwayne, all the way from Howell, Michigan. Must be cold in Howell, Michigan. I hope you guys are all doing good. Oh, here's Charlie. Hold on, let me check what he's. Uh, something happened. You're on your signal. Was down to zero. Try turn. Sorry, I gotta talk when I text. There he is again. All right. There you go. I don't know what happened. Um, your signal went down to zero. Yeah, because I was trying to get too funny with the phone. Uh, I just text you that you could turn off the Wi-Fi because sometimes when you're on mobile and, and you have a Wi-Fi signal around, it tries to fight for the Wi-Fi. So mm -hmm. you just gotta turn them off and rely on your cell, your cell signal, which is actually pretty good. So, what is all what right. is green right now? Now, now you say full blast, all green, all green. So we are, we are, we are there, bro. Okay. All right. Yeah, like I was just explaining, Charlie. You, you know, you, there's stuck in traffic, bad accident. Prayers go out to whoever was involved. It, uh, you know, when the police makes an announcement that the road is going to be closed for three or four hours, then you know <clears throat> that's a bad accident. Uh, so prayers go out to everybody. Uh, we got a lot of people on. I see some new names on here. I think everybody's excited to hear from Dr. Lee Altenberg. Of course, the numbers came out today. Uh, I cannot yeah. imagine any of us here in the village being, con uh, being surprised. Uh, the plane that went down, um, I can let Charlie address that, but... Uh, the last I saw on the news is they had the planes up looking for any kind of debris and they haven't found anything yet. So, but maybe Charlie can explain on that. Yeah, just uh, apparently a, a report was made by a passenger in a commercial flight from Kauai to Honolulu, Oahu. From the information we got, and that's that's pretty much it. Um, it's it's I mean. Kudos to that person if they if they saw that I, I have no doubt they saw something, but I, I think there was only one reported sighting that one person. So I guess everyone else was either asking for juice or water when a stewardess was coming by. <laughs> so you know it's but it's uh, it, it needs to be fully investigated because if something did go down if a plane did go down, then you know. We, we may have souls aboard that, that need some rescue attempts made, you know. So that's pretty much it for now. Yeah, well, I'm sure we will find out. I just wanted to shout out to uh, Congressman Kai Kahele, who just popped on. Yes, a lot, Kai. Hey, I'm Mel. Glad you're, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're on, Kai, because uh, I think what we're going to talk about tonight uh, is quite important um, because of, obviously, you know, the numbers. And uh, so we'll see. We'll see. So anyway, thank you for joining us. And yes, next Monday night, Kai will be on the Mel and Charlie show. So mm -hmm. we're going to surprise you guys, but I guess he blew the surprise. So anyway. Well, and and also, um, you know, oh, he's in Washington. He's in Washington, D.C. Holy crap. Yes. It's, uh, yes, it's, he's it's... in Washington. But anyway, Mel, as you can tell, I'm in my car. I've been park now going on three hours in beautiful Lihue, 
at the parking lot of Costco. So I can see those, um, uh, I don't know what they call them, but uh, the, those stealth campers you find on parking lot and they stay overnight. Yeah. I'm in my Portuguese version, sitting right in the <laughs> front seat, looking out, hey. the, look at, looking out the windows. Easy, cowboy. Stop <laughs> with the racial jokes, all right? Stop with the racial jokes. Marlene Moises just came on, and you, you, she's not going to appreciate that. Oh, she will. She, know, she knows I love her. Don't worry. Don't yeah. worry. Anyway, yeah, guys, so um, obviously the numbers came out today. You know what's surprising, and we'll talk about this when, when uh, Dr. Altenberg comes on, is I watched the uh, Mayor Blangiardi. Well, we know our mayor's response, right? They, they had the mayor had his interview, Kawhi Mayor Derek Kawakami had his interview yesterday on the news, and they asked him, you know, was he concerned about Kauai being red and the positivity rate so high? And he really wasn't concerned. And he said that he was not going to um, implement any mandates and that he, he, he believes that our, our residents know what to do. Uh, unfortunately, our residents do know what to do. They just don't know how to do it. They, you know, this is what I'm finding. And I, I listen, I get hate messages. I see a lot of posts. I see a lot of people complaining about mask mandates and freedoms. And what freedom are you losing by having to wear a mask to go in an indoor setting in the middle of a surging pandemic? I, I don't see it. And and the ones that are complaining and grumbling, a lot of them are the ones running around without their masks and going into crowded areas. So people, I, I posted today, the government's not going to do anything. Mayor Blangiardi came out today on Spotlight. They asked them, George White posed the question, Yanji posed the question to Mayor Blangiardi, and Yanji even winked at George White when she asked the question because uh, she's actually, they're, 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 they're really good at asking the right questions. And Blangiardi came out and said, if we get to that point, that he's probably going to implement the CDC recommendation. If, if Oahu gets to red, then he thinks they're going to do it. Um, subsequent to that interview, he came out on his Twitter or on his Facebook and said that he has no intention of <laughs> implementing any mandates at this time. Uh, so he kind of complete back pedal. So he must have got hammered after the uh, after the, the, the spotlight interview today. And uh, it's unfortunate, but this is the deal, folks. Numbers are climbing. Uh, look at the charts. It's, it's for real. Ka Kauai's positivity rate now, I believe today, was uh, 23%, up 3% from last week, which means the, the amount of virus on our island continues to grow, which means it continues to spread. So, and 12 more deaths last week, that's, that's almost to a day. That's almost to a day. So what is... What is the acceptable level of death for some people? Hey, Patsy, what's up? How are you, sweetie? Um, at what level is acceptable? Right? You had 10 this week. Well, I don't know what we had last week. Or 12 this week, 10 last week. What, what, at what point is it the threshold that we say, whoa? You know, uh, Josh Green was on, on the news or on his Facebook the other day telling everybody that we're fine. At the hospitals, you know, he's which is an outright lie. And I know that because I was kicked out of my hospital room on Oahu because they needed the room. So I cannot wait to hear Dr. Altenberg's uh, insights tonight because, you know, Charlie, you know this and our villagers know this. And for those of you that are you may not have even heard Altenberg, I got to give, give him this. From day one, he and his organization have been on target on target and so he's not gonna be surprised i think what we're all surprised about is when will the government step in step up and do what is right listen a mask indoor mask mandate is not gonna cripple charlie you said this last week at the last show indoor mask mandate will not impact our tourism will not impact our economy well, but let we me have think. basically raised our hands, threw up the white flag, and said, "Come and get us." And and well, that to me is what said. Is. Let Let me say this, okay? I I know we, we we're gonna we're gonna keep on beating this until people don't want to hear it anymore. I mean, they're already at that point. But this is what I know for certain: the government does not have a template on how to handle this thing. 
plain and simple. That's why they're not doing nothing. Doing nothing is usually the case where you have a big entity wondering and rolling the dice and say, hey, you know what? What do we do now? That's that's the big question. What do we do now? They haven't crossed this threshold before because they didn't do it right the first time. Okay, The first time we knew Kauai took his position the way it did, right? For some unknown reason, the local government decided, probably under the advice of the DOH, to go in a different direction. Okay? And, you know, everything is based upon, uh, oh, you know, our hospitalization, our hospitalization, hospitalization. Well, you know, the sad thing is, what if a person passes away before they even reach the hospital? Because of this. You, you can't you can't compare you you can't use hospitalization because the person never made it to the hospital so what do you do so you know each time they go down this path one can only imagine well do i do, do i rely on my own ability to think what is safe for charlie iona and his family and that's what i do and i tell anybody around me who wants to listen and those who don't want to listen, I just keep on walking. It's like, you know, active shooter. What What is the first, one of the most important things they tell you? You take cover. If the pathway is clear to make a dash for it, you make a dash for it, right? You run, you see anybody along the way, you tell them, let's go. But what if that person tells you, I don't like go, i scared. Do you stay there and try to convince them that they're possibly going to be killed if they just stay in that spot? No, you don't. Training tells you, you just keep on going. You let them be. Why? Because they may drag you back and you might get killed too, right? That's what they teach you. So is what's happening right now. If they don't want to listen to you, you keep on moving. I hope and pray that there's some people out there listening to us. I hope and pray that there's some people out there listening to the many guests that we've brought on because you know, when we bring on guests that specialize in, in these, in, in, in pandemics, in, in, in diseases, and anything you can think of that affects your health, you know, they put a lot of time, effort, and money into teaching, getting the right teaching, so they can be proficient and expert in what they do. And it's just so happened, we get the Johnny come lately that come along and say, well, I know better. Well, then, you know what? If you get sick and you cry in the blues, I don't feel sorry for you because you know better, right? You know better. Yeah. And the problem with, and I'm going to bring on Dr. Lee right now, the, and the problem with, with this pandemic, as opposed to diabetes or any other disease, um, this pandemic, this virus, this coronavirus is highly contagious and highly dangerous. And we can do what we can, Charlie, to protect ourselves and our families. But at the end of the day, we all got to work together to protect our community. We all got to work together to, to slow this damn thing down. And it's hard when we don't have the support from our leaders. And this is what happens when you put politicians in charge of a medical pandemic, a crisis. Well, you always got you. You, you're always going to have one weak link there, Mel. That, that's the thing. That's the thing I learned. You're always going to have one weak link. That's all it takes, that weak link. And unfortunately, the weak link is, happens to be in our government, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, Dr. Lee Altenberg, welcome, welcome, welcome. How are Aloha. you? Again? Aloha. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you know, the timing was perfect. Um, the new numbers came out today, and I, I really just going to turn this right over to you, Doc. We had a little discussion about uh, most of us here in the village are not surprised because you and your team and your colleagues have been sharing this scenario with us for a very, very long time. And uh, so we're not surprised, but I, I kind of wanted to give you an opportunity to to break it down for us. And for those of you that don't know, Charlie just talked about the medical experts that are out there that have been 
battling this thing and, and researching this for over two years now, and Dr. Altenberg is one. Dr. Altenberg, highly regarded uh, doctor here in the state and in, in fact in the country. So, Doc, take it away, my friend. So, well, so the numbers came out just today from the Department of Health on the current case counts um, and other data on the pandemic. And um, the most important thing I think uh, to take home from it is that we have now blasted past the peak of the Delta surge from last summer. And we are now, we are now um, at a point that only the Omicron BA1 surge in January has exceeded in the entire pandemic. And, um, and these numbers have been going up uh, for seven weeks and uh, there's no sign that they're gonna start going down. So um, that's the take home. And, and people are not aware that uh, in the general public, to my knowledge, that we are at that level, that we've actually gone past the, the peak of the Delta surge. So uh, the rest of it, uh, we can get into details, but that's the most important thing. That it's a very high, we're at a very high point of, if you're out among people in Hawaii uh, without an N95 mask or equivalent, there's a very high chance that you're gonna get infected with COVID. And I think doc, the reason why the general public doesn't know is because no one's telling them. I I watch the news, five o'clock in the morning news, five thirty, six o'clock, five four o'clock, five o'clock. I watch the news, hmm. especially on Wednesdays. And while I'm starting to hear a little bit of concern from the media and asking the right questions of our leaders, um, I'm not hearing our media or hmm. our leaders or the Department of Health or anyone coming out and telling the general public in in a in a in a way that they're going to hear it that this is seven weeks now, and there is no sign that it's going to slow down or, or, or take a downturn. That's why nobody knows. And that's why our villagers, the people, our viewers, and hopefully we have some new ones on tonight that can share the word, but gotta rely on us people. We we have to be the ones to inform and educate and because uh, cause no one else is doing it. No one else is doing it. So, so with that, Doc, why don't you get into the details, my friend? Yes, well, I can uh, I can share slides. Um, go ahead. Uh, let's see. There we go. Share screen. Okay. Let's see if this will work. Uh, window. Okay. Can you see it? I can now. Yes. Yep. Okay. So. Here's a graph of the entire pandemic of the daily case counts for the entire pandemic starting March 3rd. And that's these blue dots here. Can you see the blue dots? Are they visible? Are you there? Yeah, it's visible. It's visible. Okay, good. So this is up to May 16th. And so they started very low. And so this is on a logarithmic scale. So every unit here goes up tenfold. And this orange line is the peak of the most of the of the past week. And um, so you can see, you know, this kind of up and down, a little up and down, and then we hit the Delta wave. So there was the original, this original surge in the beginning of the pandemic. And then it kind of, then with the uh, so actually you, this this where it dove the numbers dove here that was the first stay at home order, and where the numbers dove again was the second stay at home order, and then they kind of stayed at this lower level until Delta got into the state. So the Delta variant originally was it evolved in India, and then it got transmitted around the world through jet travel, and got quickly to Hawaii. Hawaii, um, and then it started to grow exponentially. And then it peaked here uh, in August, and then it started com coming down, and then it hit a sort of a, a low level for a while, and then Omicron got to Hawaii 
in December of this year, and it had the most dramatic uh, surge in the pandemic yet. And then basically it peaked. So what happens when it peaks? That means basically something has to change, all right? So um, the to understand, you know, why do we have these numbers? Well, there's basically just three things that determine what your number of cases are. And that's number one, the infectiousness of the virus. Number two, people's behavior. And three is how much immunity there is in the population. And really that's it. And so it's the sort of the natural, the natural way of, of uh, these viruses to grow is, is exponential growth or exponential decay. And if, if you keep the, the number of, uh, if you keep the infectiousness of the virus the same, if you keep the people's behavior the same and you keep the amount of immunity in the population the same, it's just gonna be at a single exponential growth rate. And so the only reason it changes is one of those three things has to change. So people's behavior can change. So that's what happened here during these stay at home orders because the virus didn't change, the, the immunity didn't change since there were no vaccines and there was only a small number infected. So what, what caused these downturns was human behavior. Now in the Delta surge and the BA1 surge, um, there wasn't such a dramatic change in human behavior, in people's behavior in Hawaii, because there were no, there were no um, new measures in, implemented no protective public health measures. So what changed here? Well, as a combination of more people getting vaccinated to get more immunity and more people getting infected and getting immunity that way. That's the hard way to get immunity. The whole purpose of vaccination is, is it's the easy way to get immunity. So once there's a certain amount of immunity in the population, the virus is finding it hard to infect people. And then it infects less than one uh, person um, for every infected person, and then the numbers start to come down. And then uh, they reach a bottom level as a combination of, uh, well, the immunity stops changing because there's not as many cases. But then <clears throat> a new variant comes along. So that's the first, that was, that was number, uh, 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 number, number one of my three cases, I think. Anyway, the infectivity of the virus that is radically changed when BA1 comes in. And now, okay, so there's not much changing in human behavior here. There's not much changing in terms of immunity, but now the virus is much more infectious. And so it starts off on its own exponential growth rate until it starts running out of people because it's made them immune and its numbers start coming down. So what's going on here? So this is March 8th, where the end of the indoor, excuse me, March 25th, where the end of the end of the indoor mask mandate was. But the numbers had started going up beforehand because the BA2 variant got here. So these are both variants that were first spotted in South Africa, and then they both spread around the world. But BA1 got here first, and it took off first. But then BA2 actually has a faster growth rate than BA1. And people that have been infected by BA1 don't have as good immunity against BA2 because BA2 is, is evolved to be so different from all the previous variants that even if you had COVID before, it doesn't give you that much immunity to getting infected with BA2. So it takes off on its own exponential growth rate. And here we are. So this, is, this brings us to the present. And now this peak is greater than the peak of the delta of the delta surge. Let me let me take any questions there. Um, hang on here real quick. Let me just. There was there was a question about the BA four and BA five, and I'm sure you'll cover that later. Um, but right now, this BA two surge is is pretty active and and pretty much running rampant, right? Yes. Yeah. So BA4 and BA5, they were not listed in the latest variant report out of Hawaii. 
from this week um, or last that would be last week. Um, so but they uh, in South Africa, so they had a massive BA1 surge and now they're having a BA4 and BA5 surge and uh, BA4 and BA5 are also getting around the world as usual. And so <clears throat> we can ex we can expect that they're going to get here because there's no there's nothing pre uh, preventing infected travelers from getting on the plane and then infecting residents in Hawaii right now. So the, those variants are going to get here. And then uh, we who knows? I don't know. Um, I know that BA four and five do well against BA one, but I don't know how they do against BA two. So uh, if anybody has any information on that, please post it. But uh, so it's hard to say what's going to happen. But we're still in the thick of the BA two surge. Right. So oh. BA, look, looking at this graph right here, you anticipate BA two climbing higher if if nothing changes. If there's no more indoor mask mandates, there's no more uh, protections for travelers. Uh, you expect BA two to get higher than BA one? So well, higher than BA one. Who knows? Um, I don't think so because it's not taking off as fast. But where we are you know so where are we in this in this surge so we see you know a regular pattern here that's why you know they call it a wave because it has this regular pattern going up and going down going up and going down so the question is where are we in this in this shape that, that the ba2 is going to take so let me <clears throat> let me try to adjust address that let me actually let me cover a few other things so one thing that's different here from the previous ones is now everybody has home tests and by the thousands and lots of people are taking home tests uh, because it's cheaper because you're, you, uh, you can get them free. And um, by the way, if you have health insurance, you can buy eight uh, home tests per person per month and then file them as a claim with your health insurance company and get reimbursed up to $12 a test. So that's uh, very important, I think, for people to, to know. And the other thing is the, the, po the US Post Office just reopened uh, being able to order free uh, COVID home tests through the post office online. And there, um, you can they, uh, if you make an order, they will send you eight tests for free in, your, in the mail. And so I think everybody uh, should stock up on uh, their home tests in case they suspect that they've gotten infected with COVID or exposed. Uh, so any, any questions actually about that for those free home tests before I go on? Hey, Doc, I got a question for you. Yeah. Regarding um, these uh, uh, tests, okay, and, and, and you mentioned that the BA1, 2, 3, 4, you know, whatever. Uh, since, since it's, it's continually evolving, are the tests that's being produced now, do you know if they're they're like a coverall, they, they can catch mm. a wide range, or is it primarily more specific in catching the one and two and not the three and four? I guess that's no, my question. So, so these home tests, the what they do is um, they can identify uh, proteins in the virus but it's not the spike protein it's other proteins in the virus that don't evolve so fast and okay. so to my knowledge all of the current variants of SARS-CoV-2 are picked up by the home test so uh, I mean in the future we can't be sure that the it won't evolve so that we ho need a whole new set of tests but that hasn't happened yet so um, the thing is about the that people are finding with Omicron and BA2 is that um, if they've been vaccinated or infected before is they get symptoms before several days before they start getting a positive home test. So if you if you get some symptoms and you take the home test and it's negative, don't think that's the end of the story. Um, you should keep doing it for a, a you know at least four more days. Uh, before you say, um, you know, it's it can't be COVID, um, mm -hmm. because what seems to happen is that the immune system is primed 
and ready to go to mobilize into action if you've been vaccinated or previously infected. And so even before the, the virus builds up in your nose, uh, you're getting symptoms. And so it may take a few days before that viral load hits the point where the home tests can pick it up. And, and so it's very important if, you, if you've got symptoms and you take a home test, don't dismiss it if it's negative, but uh, repeat the test. Okay. So one last question before, uh, before we let you go on. Because you said that this, the, these viruses are now, you know, you talk about South Africa and places like that. Why do you think our local government is not comprehensively putting up some kind of detection so we know where it's coming from? It seems like everything and anything that can just come into the state is as a, as a free, free passage, if you want to call it that. I mean, it seems a little baffling that we got something that as serious as this, there, there is no detection system whatsoever. Well, there is a detection system. Um, it's this uh, variant surveillance. Uh, they were sending out uh, like 75 um, seek samples a week uh, mm -hmm. earlier in the pandemic. I don't know what the, I think they upped it to maybe 150. I, I'm not fuzzy on that. So they're, they're s sending um, samples of positive tests uh, to be fully sequenced so they can know exactly what the variant is uh but they're not announcing it as soon as it's discovered uh it's only coming out every two weeks and uh if you're only if you're doing 150 tests then you're going to miss anything that's below much below one percent of, of all the cases mm. so it's not so it's going to be delayed in terms of when it picks it up when it's gotten here so i'm not sure i'm not sure what you know what the actions that are supposed to be taken when when we suddenly see you know what all right we're going to see ba5 and ba4 are going to show up and so uh you know it may be two weeks after they show up that we learn about it because of the delay and the release of that data and then what do we do well there's no public health measures being taken at all uh other than um i think they've reopened the mass testing sites uh I read a, an announcement about that on Oahu. Um, otherwise, I don't know what I don't know what the health department is doing in terms of public health measures, besides um, you know making some, you know making online messages and uh, the press press release. But we're not getting any kind of um, uh, any kind of non pharmaceutical interventions uh, as a program coming out of the out of the state of Hawaii. Uh, other than uh, the schools continuing to mask. So, uh, you know, if I'm missing something, please let me know. But as you as you mentioned earlier, uh, Mayor Blangiardi is not willing to impose any public health protections um, regardless. <laughs> so this, I mean, the thing is, we, you know, we've been masking for two years and to, 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 to start masking again, could slow this peak down and save lives. And it's not gonna make us uh, any more miserable than we've been the past two years. Um, and, you know, here, here's here's my favorite mask, all right? So here's, I'm gonna, my little demonstration is, here I am, I, I might be infected because at least like 30% of the BA2 infections are completely asymptomatic. Um, I might be infectious and not know it and be around somebody and give them COVID. And here I do this and now I can be around somebody and not give them COVID. And for this little simple thing, uh, this little simple act with this little piece of material, I'm saving somebody from getting infected and from them infecting their family and possibly making their family very sick it's as simple as that. Can you hear what I'm saying? Yep. Not clear. My not voice, clear. I'm not clear. So I don't need to take my voice, take this off to talk to you. I can leave it on. And this particular model, this is my favorite model, the 3M Aura N95 mask. 
and it has like 99.7% blockage of all particles. Uh, so it's even better than the N95 rating. This can, you know, this can save a life with this simple act. And uh, so to me, it's the most trivial thing that you can do to protect yourself, to protect your family, to protect others' families. And why, um, why our government leadership is unwilling to require this to prevent people from endangering each other unknowingly uh, is, is uh, a very disturbing issue that I think needs to be thoroughly discussed. So well, that's my you know, spiel I, about I know, I know we have Congressman Kahele on tonight. Um, I know we'll have other lawmakers on after the fact, if not they're on, uh, if not presently, but, and they'll hear this and they'll see it. And you know, this is where my call goes out to uh, we, we know the governor, we know the mayors have all made the decision that they're not going to do anything. They're just going to let this, I say, rip through the community. They're relying on treatments. They're relying on therapeutics. We know for a fact that the hospitals are full. Uh, and I don't know why our lieutenant governor continues to minimize the impacts that the hospitals are suffering. Maybe not all COVID patients, but the beds are beds. People need beds. I'm not sure why, but m what what frustrates me is we have an entire state legislature, uh, we have county councils that all need to step up and start urging our decision makers to do something. We cannot allow this just just to go through without even trying to slow it down. Uh, there's no explanation. To me, it's gross negligence when you can sit there and tell the state that we're seven weeks we have constant increases in cases constant increases in hospitalizations we have now we're seeing more death because those are delayed statistics right because obviously from the time you get covid uh, there's, there's a period of time between hospitalizations and, and death so we know it's not going to get any better but no one is saying anything to urge our decision makers in the state to do something and and except for this show, I don't hear anybody talking about it, and it's it's extremely frustrating, Doc. I can only imagine how frustrating it is for you because you are you 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 are looking at the trends, you're looking at the numbers, um, and and you know what's coming. And I and I thought Blangiardi, in his spotlight this morning, he seemed like he he knew what was coming. He was preparing the people for an indoor mask mandate. Shortly after that, he posted in social media that he has no intentions of, of implementing any type of measures going forward. So we suffer, and, and I'm afraid of what's to come. Well, I was especially disappointed. You know, I, I, I thought Mayor Kawakami did such a great job uh, for much of the pandemic. But his statement today... In particular, the, the one thing that got me when he said that the hospital situation is stable. Well, let me zoom zoom uh, down to the ho hospitalization situation in Hawaii. So um, here's again a log logarithmic graph showing the number in the hospital. And so here's the here was the peak of the Omicron wave of the BA1 wave, which uh, hit 400. And here we are with this BA2 wave, which has been going since the end of March. And this curve here is nearly a straight line. That means exponential growth. So when you plot an exponential growth rate on a logarithmic curve like this, it turns into straight lines. And this, the slope of this line gives, means that it's doubling every 15 days, all right? Every two weeks, at the current rate, we're getting twice as many people in the hospital as the previous two weeks. And so we're now up into, what was it, 130 something today? Um, yeah. yeah. And so in, in by um, beginning of June, if it keeps up at this rate, we're, we're gonna have twice as many in the hospital. And if it keeps up, keeps up at that rate, then there's gonna be twice again you know, two weeks after that. Um, so that would be by uh, late June, there would be uh, 400 in the hospital. 
So I now I don't think it's going to keep at this rate. I think it's going to slow down. But this is not a stable hospital situation. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a we're in a critical exponential growth rate. And if it doesn't slow down, we are in trouble, big trouble again. So, um, you know, it's not, this is not a state, exponential growth is not a stable situation. So to describe the hospital situation as stable, it's like, you know, a guy, uh, he, he falls off his lanai on the, on the 30th floor and uh, he, he, he's now zooming past the 15th floor and he says, well, things are okay so far. Maybe it's not so bad. Um, that's the kind of situation if, uh, if you, you say things aren't bad until they, they hit this crisis level when they're growing exponentially. So, um, so I don't know, you know, I don't know who his information source is, where he got the idea that the hospital is, is stable. It may be adequate at the moment, but the growth rate in, in hospitalizations is, is unstable. Doc, we have a Department of Health, we have Dr. Libichar, we have Dr. Campbell, we have these people that should be informing our leadership. We have Department of Health people on every island should be informing our uh, decision makers, policy makers of these trends. You know, you're talking about this numbers doubling every 15 days. I can tell you that the hospital capacity today will not be able to handle another 400 case, 400 people in the hospital in, in, in a month. Uh, so what's going to happen, right? They're going to start canceling surgeries again. They're going to start uh, bringing in nurses from the mainland. And, and they, we've been down this road before, Doc. That's why I'm pissed off, because we know what's coming. And, and we, we know what's coming because we, we're not doing anything to slow it down or change its course. We, it's just a matter of, but I mean, is it just you and, and your colleagues that are working on these numbers? Is, is, it, is it, don't we have anybody in the Department of Health that should be telling the governor, hey, uh, we, we're in a crisis, guy. If we don't, if we don't get involved, we're not, this train isn't gonna stop. And, and, and we still got a couple more variants in South Africa that, is probably here already. We just haven't found it yet. I don't know what else to do. Uh, you know, I, I can only yeah. hope that the, the people watch this. Again, like I said, we got Congressman Kelly. I know we got um, other lawmakers that, that tune in after the fact. And I, I can only hope that tomorrow somebody's going to stand up and say, hey, Governor, <laughs> wake up. This is real. I can only hope. Well, the whole idea that the only thing you should be concerned about is if there's not enough hospital beds, uh, that means you're okay if if 400 people are in the hospital and you don't go above that, you're okay with that. So, um, you know, the the um, the percentage of, of people that were hospitalized that end up dying is very high. And um, so this idea that only only overfilling the hospitals is the only problem, it ignores the fact that there, there's hundreds of really, really sick people, and a lot of them are gonna, gonna die. That to me is, is it's a symptom of denial of reality, okay? We just have, we have a massive society-wide, and, and, you know, and it's coming from our leadership, uh, a denial of reality, and uh, I, that's what I find more than frustrating. I find it really disturbing because, uh, you know, what, what other kinds of reality is being denied by our leadership? And what other kinds of trouble are we going to get into? Because we're not dealing with what's really going on and we're playing various mind games to tell us uh, something different from the reality. Um, let, me, let me go through some of these other slides to um, just to, to, to give some more perspective on where we are in this current wave. So before I leave this hospitalizations slide, you notice the slope here for the BA2 wave is much, is much not as steep as the BA1 wave. So this was really steep. So this was, is what makes me think that we're not gonna get as high 
uh, as the, the BA1 wave because it's, it's, a, it's a gentler slope. So here, what you know, what the doubling time was, um, you know, something like nine days, all right, which is uh, really, truly explosive. So here it's, it's slower, but it's still relentless, okay? And, and you just wait long enough. If the exponential growth rate doesn't slow down, you get into any numbers you want. So let me, let me go back to earlier slides and I wanna show something that's very interesting. So we have the problem now with all the home tests that a lot of people are not going to the, uh, the lab reported PCR tests the way they used to be. And so our measure, and that, that's the only way that we measure the case, the case counts. And so these case counts and the Department of Health said these are likely to be greatly undercounting the number of cases. So the case counts here are in the blue. It's like the previous slide, except this is, um, this is a, on a linear, linear plot, not a, a, not a logarithmic. But I was curious about, okay, what other information do we have? Well, every day, besides the cases, we have the positivity rate. So that's the fraction of the people that get tested with the PCR tests that turn out to be positive. And they're really high right now. And so I wondered, could you use the positivity rate as a way of, as a predictor of actually what the case count rate was? And you can plug in and then actually derive a simple formula. And it turns out that it's a really good predictor and using this formula, okay, applying it to the positivity rates, this is the whole pandemic. And um, we get the orange line are the, are the daily case numbers predicted from the daily positivity rate. And you can see now here they're, they're way off, okay. But uh, if you train it to learn uh, sort of once we got the, once we got the pandemic, uh, our pandemic uh, uh, sampling and equipment in order, then this predicted, this orange line fo follows the blue line really closely and it follows the Delta surge very closely, okay? And, and it follows it, and then it follows the Omicron surge in January very closely, and to, except in the peak here because uh, the, situ the system was so overwhelmed, they couldn't, they couldn't record the negative cases, so they didn't know what the positivity rate was. So it gets out of whack there, but then it comes back in line and follows very closely the case numbers until we get to February. And now we notice that the orange line starts to diverge from the blue line, okay? And so the blue line is the actual recorded case numbers, but this orange line is the predicted case numbers based on the positivity, based on the way, on the situation, the, the way it was for the whole middle of the pandemic. So if this orange curve is, is the correct curve, then we don't have, you know, like 900 cases this past week or what, what was it? Uh, it was 800 something average. We have like 3000 a day. Okay. So this, um, th so this is, you know, very uh, disturbing um, that the actually, the amount of the, the amount of this current surge could be actually much, much higher than we get from even the case numbers. So these case numbers now have outstripped the Delta wave. Here's the Delta wave. So our current case numbers have outstripped them, but this predicted value based on the positivity rates would make it th three times higher. So let me do a close up here. So here we are coming in from January uh, and February and March is where the, the curves start to diverge, all right? And so here's our current case counts. And, but here's the, the amount that would be predicted based on the positivity rates. And that puts it up like 2,500. So, I think the numbers are probably somewhere in between these two. It's probably not as high here because 
the people that go get tested, a lot of the people that go get tested actually took a home test and turned out positive. And so they know they're positive and they, but they want to get verification and diagnosis. So they go and go in and get tested. So that'll up the positivity rate. Um, and that means this prediction, this prediction formula is no longer accurate. So, but, but the, the case counts are, are definitely somewhere in between these two curves. They're much, they're bigger than the blue curve and they're somewhere in between this and the orange curve. So we could be really, uh, um, a big chunk of, of January's wave again. And, and not even realize it based on the blue blue counts. Any question on this predict, prediction formula business? I don't have a question, but I, I saw and I can't remember this. The doctor that he, he's from the UK. He he they did the, he does the exact same thing that you do, and hmm. uh, his findings were the same. The using the positivity rate. Ah. The, yeah, it was it was it's kind of like deja vu right now. I, was, you know, I don't think I heard it from you, but it was. Can't remember his name. He has his own YouTube channel. He does a daily briefing, and I try to catch it at least three times a week. But um, and it was about a month ago, and huh. and that was his warning of uh, to the government was, hey, you know, uh, because it, they have the same issues, right? They have the same issues of testing, decreased numbers of testing in the UK, uh, like everywhere else, which I don't understand. The other question I, I wanted to address: uh, Tech Spear asked about if, if anyone knew anyone that had the Paxlovid. My older brother. Uh, had COVID for the second time. He went to call his doctor. They got him on Paxlovid right away because he is immunocompromised. Uh, my daughter, on the other hand, in Oregon, had got her COVID for the second time and mm. uh, wasn't able to get Paxlovid. So uh, Tech Spear is saying, you know, everyone should have a, a prescription of pa uh, Paxlovid in their medicine cabinet. I agree. I agree uh, that, you know, we should be sending this. This should be so available. But that's not the case, Tex. It's not the case, and um, I'm not sure when it will be the case. I just want to chime in. So, so actually, you're, you're, I'm sorry, your daughter got it COVID again, and she got vaccinated after the first time, right? Correct. Uh, she she got really hammered the first day, but but she was she had symptoms several days prior, tested negative, hmm. uh, and I think it was on her third day or so, uh, it finally kicked in positive on a home test. Uh, yeah, that's very typical. She got really sick on the first day, and then from the second day on, uh, it started to get better. So she's fine. She's doing well, thank God. Uh, and my brother also, that was his second time as well. Mm. Uh, and he's here. He's not in Oregon. So they didn't come in contact with each other. Well, that I mean, that just shows you that the, 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 the virus has evolved so far from the proteins that are used in the vaccine that uh, the current vaccines are just not very good at preventing infection much at all. Uh, I don't know the exact quantity estimation, um, but uh, it's it's not giving you very much protection. So the the main protection it has is against, you know, getting seriously ill and needing to be hospitalized. But um, but even even that uh, in uh, in the the BA1 wave, something like 40% of the fatalities were in people that had two doses and 15% were in people that had the booster as well. So um, there's still, and, and if you're, you know, if you're um, a, a, an elderly person, a senior citizen, um, your protection being vaccinated is about the same as a person uh, like 20 years younger than you, who's completely unvaccinated. So the protection declines with your age, uh, as well as with these new variants. So that's a reason to be um, very careful. Waning immunity, Doc. Well, that, yeah, I didn't mention that. I, I, that concerns <laughs> me because I, I know for a fact, in fact, Charlie just got his second booster yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, I still haven't got in mine. I'm waiting to I have surgery. So as soon as I'm completely recovered, I'm going to go get mine. But I, I know a lot of people who are not getting the next booster. It's very, it's very small, but, but, five, like 5%. But, yeah. And you got to, you got to remember it's because of the messages that they're, they're getting from the media that it, it, they're really minimizing this virus. So when you, when you put together the new variants that you, the, 
the mutated va uh, variants that are adjusting to 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 people waning immunity uh and even though we are getting more people that are getting infected which you know assists in, in their immunity at, at some point we're gonna be a bunch of there's gonna be a vulnerable community and uh i think a lot of people may may get sick and die i mean is, is there any truth to that it's certainly possible um yeah the so the the waning immunity that's an, uh, the other issue is after you get the the vaccine or the booster the the immunity will peak after a couple of weeks but then uh, it starts to decline in a few months and uh, the recent they're finding with the with the fourth shot the second booster uh, it starts to decline after two months so you know there, there it gets to be you know might you might if you're if you're constantly at risk of getting exposed you should get you should get the um the fourth shot as soon as you can uh if you're like you know pretty safe but maybe planning to you know do something that's more risky or required to do something more risky then you might want to time it uh, so that the the booster is at its peak level so that's the that's the problem is we haven't yet um got any new any vaccines that are anything other than the original wuhan strain spike protein and that was two years ago two years of evolution away from that is is rendering our vaccines much much less effective i mean the original mra vaccines when they came out against the original strain they were extre extremely effective against uh even infection something like what was it uh in the 90s against even getting infected but the um the virus has evolved around to get away from its old look old shape so it's basically it's put on a disguise it's the same nasty virus but now it doesn't look the way it looked in its original mug shot and so uh the the police namely your antibodies are not able to identify it as well and it gets around and it gets in there um so I, I'm, you know, but in terms of what, you know, what is going to change right now? So what does it look like is, is happening in this pandemic? There's just this endless treadmill of new variants evolving, and then they spread over the world and they infect people or reinfect people. And, um, and the situation doesn't look like it's going to change in, in the near future unless uh, something fundamental is done that's different so what would that be it would it would be the virus the vaccines catch up with the evolution of the virus so i you know i can't wait for an omicron specific vaccine to become available but that might not be for several months but i mean they're working on it and testing it um and there's a lot of other vaccine under development there are people some people are trying to get vaccines that will get that'll be active against any variant that uh, don't focus on the spike protein as much as other parts of the virus. And there are people working on nasal vaccines because, you know, we basically, we have like two different immune systems, or, you know, patrols, since you guys were in law enforcement. So you got, you got the body patrol. And when you get the vaccine injected into you, that, uh, that steps up the body patrol uh, to create antibodies that circulate throughout your body and protect your, your organ systems um, from being attacked by the virus. But it won't, doesn't protect your nasal passages um, or your upper respiratory tract. That needs another squad car, as it were. And you have to get the, the vaccine onto those tissues to stimulate the what's called the IgA, immunoglobulin A, antibody system and that system blocks the the criminal from even getting into your house it's all right so uh, when it gets to your nose it's like trying to pound through the door and the, and the nasal vaccines will be like uh, your security guards outside the door to stop it from even getting in right now what's happening is it's getting it's breaking through the door and getting into the house into your body and then the, the body immune system, the I, it's called immunoglobulin G, IgG, those antibodies come and, uh, and, and slow down the virus, all right? But uh, the problem is that, uh, and, and so actually they, 
they were so good that um, even they were able to stop uh, stop it from getting in the door uh, from the original virus. But now the virus has evolved so that it evades the your body um, patrol system, and and there is no um, uh, there is no nose patrol system unless you've actually had been infected. Um, but uh, the thing about the evolution of this BA two is that it's um, it's figured out how to evolve how to evade the the out, outdoor security guards from even prior infection by its by its disguise. Well, I don't know if that's a little helpful immunology there. Well, I, you know, I, I yeah, and you're preaching to the choir. Uh, it's unfortunate. I wish uh, you know, I wish the, the the general population had an opportunity to to hear it uh, because I think. A lot of people just don't. They, they they totally underestimate this, the danger of this virus, and it's uh, a little scary. Let me go. So there's this problem, as I mentioned, in that the home tests have thrown off our ability to measure how bad the pandemic is. It's somewhere in here, but there's a other sources of data, and one of them um, that uh, somebody posted on social media. I, I'm uh, I would love to credit them, but I forget their name. I hope they're watching actually is this, there's this company called Kinza that makes these internet thermometers, all right? So that, you, you know, you take your temperature and it sends it off on the internet and, and then they collect the data and they can collect the data for a whole area and see what's happening with fevers in a whole geographic area. And based on their reports from these, their internet thermometers in people's homes, they're ranking Hawaii now at 84 at critical risk and they say ex exercise extreme caution. So this is their website. It's called uh, Kinza Health Weather. And, um, and they say uh, there is uncontrolled spread of severe illness. Protect yourself by avoiding all social contact. And so this is a, an, an independent source of data that says based just on fevers, you know, we are in bad shape. I think that that slide went viral. Uh, uh, Mara says it was George White that posted it. George White is an amazing collector of data. Uh, COVID Act Now is uh, COVIDActNow.org is another uh, amazing site that I, I don't know how they get the daily data, and they post the daily data, and it's and it's correct data, and our state refuses to share that those infer those the, those the data with 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 us here in Hawaii. It's 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 just wrong, and uh, I don't see how difficult it would be to keep. Our, I think if everyone saw the daily counts, they would be paying more attention. Uh, yeah, indeed. So I mean, one thing that the Department of Health could do is uh, go back to daily reporting. I think that would be a, a way to help better inform the population. So, and this this Kinza on down on the page, it says there is. A critical risk of illness in Hawaii. COVID-19 cases are very high and spreading, well, while influenza flu cases are moderately high and spreading. So I don't know how they distinguished flu from COVID, but that's a very interesting report there. I, I'm concerned that <clears throat> people are getting symptoms and they're taking the home test and they're testing negative. And they're calling the doctor and the doctor asks them, hey, you know, you take a home test. Yes, it's negative. And the doctors are jumping to that diagnosis of flu or the cold because of the negative tests. And we know we now know that these tests don't trigger the positive result uh, for a few days, maybe a week. So I think a lot of people that are running around, going to work, going to the bar, going to parties, going to gatherings. Uh, not maliciously, but under the, you know, with the belief that they have a common cold uh, are, are further spreading this virus. So one thing I, you know, in terms of the, the, the science of how these things grow, so the, the, the crucial number is the reproduction numbers. How many people are you infecting if you're infected? And that's, there, that's a single number for the entire population. And everything that's going on kind of 
dumps into that pool of determining what the reproduction number is. So again, the infectiousness of the virus, people's behavior, and then the amount of immunity. So um, if you if that reproduction number is above one, cases grow. If it's below one, cases decline. And so we can see um, in this, um, this is basically a graph of that reproduction number. And so, and I've done it starting with the Delta wave and the BA1 wave and then our current situation. And so this reproduction number is the, if it's above zero, that means the numbers are growing. And so in the Delta wave, we saw them, the, the reproduction number went up and then it started coming down uh, and then it went negative. And that's, that's when the cases, case count started to come down. So this point here where the reproduction number hits, um, well, this is the log of that. So the, the zero corresponds to reproduction number one. So um, then, it begin, then you get into negative exponential, gr exponential growth, which is exponential decline. And it goes down and then it, it's, uh, it starts to slow its decline. And then when it hits here, then the cases are flat again. So this is a whole wave and it kind of looks like a sine wave. So the start of the wave, here's the, the fastest growth rate of the wave. Here's where it hits the top and is flat. And then it starts coming down again. Very Here's where it's coming down fastest and then it flattens out. So that was the shape of the delta wave. Here's the shape of the BA1 wave, January's wave. Very, 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 very high reproduction number, very high exponential growth rate, and very high drop off. So if you look at the width of this area here, this is the this is the um, the rise of the of the wave. You see that the delta, the BA1 wave has had a shorter time period of, of rising and then it came down. So it was a, you know, it was a, a very explosive and then a rapid decline. Now here we are in the middle of this BA2 wave. And th this is a bit of encouragement here is that this, we seem to have hit this bump here in the growth rate and it seems to the growth rate seems to be coming down a bit so this is all still positive so that means we're still rising but we can imagine that this is giving us something about some information about the width of this wave and it suggests that uh the the ba2 peak may be somewhere um in by late june and or middle middle of june uh, and after which it starts coming down. So how high it gets at that point, I don't know, but it suggests that we have at least, you know, uh, th at least two or three more weeks of, of rise before the numbers start coming down. But, um, but I think the fact that this is starting to drop here gives us some idea that, um, you know, that we're like about here in the curve and not, you know, not way earlier. And uh, so there, you know, the, the BA wave is showing some signs of weakening. Uh, that's not in terms of, <clears throat> it's still gonna be keep going up for a few more weeks. Uh, but then there it shows some indication that after that it should come down based on this extrapolating based on this pattern of the previous waves of their shapes. So this is very speculative, but um, it's following the pattern of the previous spikes. And, and what is your ballpark estimate uh, before we see the other two BA4 or BA5? Oh. I mean, you know, it's gonna, you know, we're gonna see this happen again and again with different variants um and uh it's just something i guess we've got to brace for well this is i mean the pitiful thing is when when the ba1 wave hit you saw people in the press saying this could be this could end the pandemic by giving everybody immunity well that was a pipe dream all right 
um, the, the virus is way smarter than giving up the ghost at that point. It's got lots of evolutionary tricks up its sleeve. Exactly what, we don't know, but it doesn't show any signs of running out of tricks as the BA4 and 5 variants show. And, and who knows what's going to come after that? So in terms of the big picture of this, of this viral evolution, it could just keep doing this for years. And really the only way that we're, we're gonna thwart it is if we can come up with our vac vaccines faster than it can come up with variants. And we're, we're pitifully behind at doing that now. Um, you know, the, the mRNA vaccines, they had like three weeks after the very first gene sequence from the Wuhan strain was, was released on the internet, three weeks later, they had a, the vaccine in hand, the mRNA vaccine in hand. And all the rest of the time until we could get it in our arms was all in um, production and testing and approval. But they actually had the vaccine in their hands three weeks after the, the virus was first spotted. And so, uh, you know, at that rate, you know, any of these variants, we could have um, vaccine, mRNA vaccine produced against them within weeks of the, their first discovery. So the, the delays in all of the, the testing and regulation and um, uh, production ramp up. So, but these are technical problems uh, that are potentially solvable. And I think the, the real question is, does our, does our government uh, have the will to, um, to pursue it? Uh, Dr. Eric Topol has, in a recent uh, Guardian op-ed, said, you know, we need uh, like an Operation Warp Speed to get all these variant vaccines uh, available very rapidly. And we've dropped the ball on that. I think we lost Uncle Charlie. Uh, oh, there he is. There he is. Doc, we're at 8 o'clock. Um, I want to respect your time, but I do want to give you an opportunity. I, and what I want you to do is basically share what you think or what should be done now um, by our leaders, by each of us. What 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 would sh what would sh uh, we what should we be doing as as individuals? What what would you like to see the state and the counties do? To, to slow this virus down um, as soon as possible, I guess. Yes. So I just had one more slide, which I'll finish sharing on the, what's, the, what's happening in the schools, the cases in the schools. So this shows the number of uh, cases reported. There's on the website, the Department of Education. They're exploding exponentially as well. And uh, here you can see the same pattern as the general population. So um, now, in terms of intervention, so, so we have, you know, the government can, can take various courses of action and has unique powers that individuals don't have, that co companies don't have, unique powers and therefore unique responsibilities to use those powers for the public benefit. So all the, you know, all the different interventions that we have, uh, to, to deal with the pandemic, um, you know, we have the mask mandates, we have testing mandates, vaccine mandates, um, stay at home orders, capacity limits on gathering. Um, did I leave any out? Uh, well, contact tracing. Um, what, what I, I'm sure I must have left something out, but e each of those has a cost and a benefit. And in my mind, you should, you know, you should implement anything where the benefit exceeds the cost. And so, you know, in my mind, you know, a mask mandate has trivial cost. All right, this cost me two dollars, and I and I, uh, you can get it even cheaper now. This 3M Aura mask, and you saw, you know, it's easier to put on this mask than it is to to get fully dressed for the office and that you know and that and it can save lives so the cost of a mask mandate is trivial uh and the 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 benefits are um you know lives 
people that would have died if you hadn't declared the um, mask mandate, uh, if you it, people that wouldn't, you can save lives, simple as that, and prevent illness. Now, I haven't mentioned long COVID so far. So, you know, if there weren't any long COVID and the vaccines were as protective against hospitalization and death as they are, I, I wouldn't be worried. But the, the, the latest science shows that the chance of having health problems for months after an, even a mild case of COVID, when you're fully vaccinated, it's at least 7%. And there's other estimates that it's much higher. So there's a, a span of estimates, but at least 7%. That means at least one out of all the, one out of 14 of all those, of all those 800 cases a day that we're getting now is gonna have, are gonna have health problems for months. And they, they range from fatigue, from cognitive dysfunction, uh, to uh, injured kidneys, injured lungs, uh, injured liver. Uh, and, you know, what's especially disturbing, I don't know of many other viruses where they've documented that it can damage the brain, all right? Cold viruses don't damage the brain. Anything that can get anywhere near damaging the brain should be of extreme concern because it, it's one of the least, the organs least capable of healing. And, uh, and uh, th there can be a lot of damage that you don't even realize. So one recent study found that half of people that had COVID, their clotting system is, is deranged for uh, months afterwards. Okay, and so this is not something that uh, you notice, you don't feel the problem. You know, it's like high blood pressure. You can't feel that you've got high blood pressure, but, uh, but the clotting factors are, in, are um, way out of whack. And that's in half of people. So there's like even uh, un, uh, unknown um, and unsensed long COVID that's happening uh, in a large fraction of people that get COVID. And that's why I don't want to get this virus. Um, so, uh, and that's why um, that's why the policy should be not just aim aimed at keep reducing, keeping the hospitals from overfilling, but keeping people from getting this this sickness causing virus. So, you know, the most the most costly intervention was the stay at home order, and that's what you do when nothing else is working. But we've got all all these other measures that work, and and so masking is a trivial is has it just a trivial cost, and and clearly what's going on now is not working. All right, so um, these numbers show what we're doing now is not working, and you either say, well, we're just going to let it rip as the current policy is, we're going to uh, you know just Put out some service public service announcements warning people and that's all we're going to do and hope that people don't die or uh, the government can can do some of the things it's uniquely able to do and one of those is an indoor mask mandate so that would be because it doesn't it doesn't close any business down it doesn't stop tourists from coming to hawaii it it's very minimally costly to the individual it, it protects people um so uh, there, there's no economic cost. And frankly, if you can keep people, keep your workforce from getting sick, as happened in the January surge, you increase the total productivity of the society with very little cost. So that would be my number one. And in fact, Governor Ige said, if we see another surge, that the state is ready to re-implement the mask policy. So we've had seven weeks of surge. We've now passed the Delta surge. And are and are heading only uh, uh, only upward, and we don't know how we're, high we're going to get. So where is Governor Ige uh, keeping his word that the state is ready to reimplement the mask policy? So that you know that's number one, the the the, the least cost, most effective uh, implementation uh, that we can do for public health. Yeah, you know I keep hearing. In fact, I think I, I heard. I can't remember who it was, if it was Van Giardi or, or Ige talk about, I think the question was, should people all expect to get COVID? And, and I, an answer was, yeah. 
that a lot of people are going to get it. But I think going back to what you, you spoke of um, long COVID, they're, they're completely missing the point. They, they are so missing the point where we could be trying to prevent uh, people from getting COVID. Uh, all of the masks, I mean, all of the test kits, which are important, but uh, they should be also sending out masks to everyone. Uh, we didn't really touch on the traveling, uh, but all of the, all of our flights now, I just had to fly out uh, to Oahu and, and uh, barely anyone was wearing a mask, including the flight crew. Uh, the airports are filled with people with no masks. So there is actually no intent by, I think, the general public to uh, wear masks uh, and, and I, it just bothers me that as we watch these numbers rise every single week, and it's rising every single day. We lost 12 people last week. Uh, 12. And again, what's the threshold? What's the threshold or what's the acceptable number of people dying before you, you do something? Is, is 12 not enough? Uh, well, it is if you're one out of 12 or the members of their families. But there is absolutely no urgency placed on on this crisis right now, not, and I think that is the frustration. You know, Mel, I I, I texted on your on your last Mel and Charlie show when you said uh, that you know we're 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 seeing a start of a surge here, and I said this ain't the start of a surge. You know, we've already passed the Delta surge, and I think, but this reflects that this is. The message should be coming from the message from the Department of Health is, you know, we're in the seventh week of growing cases. Well, that doesn't give you any idea relative to where we've been in the rest of the pandemic. So the I mean, the public, the public health needs to be putting out a message that we are really maxed out. We've we've blown past previous records uh, of previous surges. And and I think so the problem is people are um, people are responding to the information environment that they're in, in terms of how much mask wearing they're doing, and they are not getting the correct information to be able to uh, make the correct judgments about their risk and the risk of receiving and the risk of producing uh, disease in other people. So. Um, that's one of the responsibilities of the government is to get the information environment that people are working within correct. And the mask mandate would give the message that we are in trouble and we need to do something. So that's in addition to, uh, that's, you know, putting your, putting your um, money where your mouth is um, and making it, taking action and, you know, actions speak louder than words. So, uh, that I think is is another really important reason for the state to re, re, reintroduce the mask mandate, and you know so when you know when do you take off the masks? Well, when the cases are uh, dropping at a certain rate, then and and you can predict that they would keep dropping if you take the masks off. Then I think, um, I mean it's still it's still a trivial cost that uh, you know I, I I just don't see as long as there's COVID around. Uh, the cost of wearing a mask is is not going to exceed the benefit um, in you know in my own calculation. So um, now you, you, the vaccine is very important to protect your your life, and we need to get boosted at a much higher rate. And that's a you know, but the state is all, you know the state is putting out messages for people to get boosted, and it's not doing any good. But maybe that's because people don't realize how dire a moment we are in with this BA2 variant. So, um, so you know, all the other, all the other, all the other interventions you you made made are also very important. I mean, you know, unfortunately, we are at that point where the intervention needs to occur. The indoor mask mandate needs to occur. But if the state had been transparent. And, and whether it was intentional or, or they're just ignorant, uh, I don't think they're ignorant. I think they just they just didn't want to uh, disrupt the economy in any way, and they believe a mask mandate would. I don't know how they see that, but if they had been transparent, 
if they had continued the daily reporting, if they had been honest with the public about this virus and the evolution of the virus and the BA1 and the BA2, informing the public of the long haul or long COVID uh, statistics, if they had done that all along, if they had stopped minimizing this virus, as we know, the Lieutenant Governor has, has, has done this for a long time, people would have not taken off the masks. You know, people would have, I, I mean, because they knew they had, like you just said, if they were, if they're provided the correct information, they'll make the correct decisions. But now we've gone months now with the people being told that this is not that bad, that we're entering the endemic portion of this pandemic, that that the treatments are available, that, you know, if you get COVID, you just get a Paxlovid and you're fine. Mm -hmm. That has just forced everyone to believe, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm going to this wedding, I'm going to this graduation, I'm not going to wear my mask because it ain't that bad. Had we not minimized this months and months and months ago, I think people would still be wearing the mask. And I don't think we would need an indoor mask mandate. I think our numbers would be down. If we did not take away the mask mandates for airports, for airlines, our numbers would not be surging like today. So they need to do something now, but it's because of their inaction months ago. That's my take. Yeah. Well, think about the mask mandate is it may not be enough by itself to bring the reproduction number below one, but it will lower that slope. And that will that will do two things. It'll reduce the total number of people that get sick in the surge, and it'll, it'll cause the surge to come sooner. I mean, the, the peak to come sooner and end sooner. So, um, you know, with the, uh, so I mean, our Delta surge, our Omicron surge, that, that was all under the mask mandate. And clearly the viral infectiousness overcame that. But without that mask mandate, with, oh my God, there would have been many more deaths and many more people with long COVID. So, um, you know, it's just the cost versus the benefit. The cost is, is nothing. The benefit is health saved, lives saved. Well, unfortunately the timing is bad because it's an election year. Um, every legislator is up for election. The governor's gone. Uh, we got all these people running for lieutenant, uh, for governor. And no one wants to be a disruptor. No one wants to 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 uh, create a wave or, or create any kind of controversy. So they're just going to stay quiet and hope, hope that we get through this without many more people dying. Unfortunately, as Donna Mercado Kim, Senator Mercado Kim told us two years ago on our show, hope mm -hmm. is not a strategy. And they are relying on hope. This is what bothers me, though, Doc. In the early on, I could, I could, I could, I could understand because they didn't know as much about the virus. Yes. There, that's no excuse today. What you showed us tonight is clear data. That is, is it's, it's like math. Uh, you, your colleague said math doesn't have a political agenda. You know, math and and these models don't have a political agenda. This is the numbers. This is the chart. You take it for what it's worth. And I, for the life of me, I cannot understand how that is not triggering our state and our counties to do something proactive, even though it's so late, to slow this thing down. But it is what it is. Well, I mean, the thing to be aware of, this is happening nationwide and even internationally, uh, this COVID denialism and minimiz minimization. So, you know, it's, it's something beyond Hawaiian society, something beyond American. Um, and uh, it's something in the, you know in the, in the way our society is working, but it's it's really dangerous. All right. So in addition, just the people that are dying, it's it just indicates uh, the the mechanisms of dealing with the reality are not working. And and I think there needs to be a major reform movement that analyze what's the problem, why why is this happening, and figure out figures out what to do with you know, what to do about it, because uh, we have enormous, you know, the environmental problems that we're facing with global warming are va are vastly worse than COVID.
COVID. Um, and if we don't deal with that reality, you know, civilization itself, you know, when we can't make enough food for everybody, uh, when our, you know, everything that we're depending on as far as the weather is no longer there, you know, this is the real, real danger um, to, to everything that we hold dear in the future. And so, I, you know, we have to, if we can use this COVID, the, this COVID denialism phenomenon to figure out how do we get our society to deal better with reality uh, and take action, uh, that will be an, a blessing uh, uh, if we can if we can preserve the world from global warming. So, um, you know, let's think about how to transform these thoughts into a political movement of reform, where we get transparency, where we get people that deal with the reality that make optimal decisions in terms of costs and benefits um, and, and, and a population that demands, that demands good uh, decision making. Well, Doc, I, I mean, I, the, the simple answer is you uh, put the policy making, you put the, you know, the, the emergency medical crisis in the hands of the medical experts and the scientists. That, that's how you do it. You got to take the politics mm -hmm. out of it. That, that's that's what you need to do. And I don't know if I was the governor, I, I, I'm telling you, I, the Department of Health would be driving my COVID ship. That's who it would be. It wouldn't be a politician. It would be a Department of Health, a steersman on the canoe. That's to me, that's that's what you do. You let the experts mm -hmm. do what they need. If they had done that, if they had listened to the experts, we wouldn't be here today. And the sad reality is that many, many people lost their lives, in my opinion, unnecessarily because this state failed to act. And that's a that's a horrific pill to swallow, mm. but that's the truth, in my opinion. So, anyway. so Mel, yeah, please, let's, please. let's uh, trace let's trace that back. So, so why is why are the executives not listening to the public health people? It's because of the, the way that the power, uh, the power over these health things is, is um, put into statute. And you know, that's a function of the legislature. And so why aren't the legislators clamoring for a better decision-making system than this current dysfunctional one? And because they think what the population wants is that we just pretend COVID's not here and uh, you know march around uh, you know, well, the Russian troops of COVID are shooting at us and pretend that they aren't. Um, and that's how we're going to win the war. So it has to do with their beliefs about what the population wants. So the population has to be organized to express a different demand of its legislators. Um, and I think that's why, you know, it comes down to really to democracy and, uh, and, and a cultural movement from the general population. And it's happened in Hawaii in the past. Um, you know, the uh, the new constitution uh, and the results of the labor movement have all been able to achieve great reform in Hawaii's past. And and I think we need to go back to basics and ask what needs to be done with reform today. Well, you know, I've said this many times on the show, uh, many of our shows, that I'm not voting for anyone. It didn't stand up for me and my family during COVID. I'm not. I, I don't care. I will vote for the other person. Um, and, and I hope everyone will do the same. Uh, when, when COVID came out, it, you know, when everybody was afraid, it was, it was the popular thing to stand up mm. as a legislator, as a governor. Even Josh Green in the beginning, he, remember Josh Green, he was a different person in the beginning because that was the flavor of the month. But as again, as the state started to minimize and people started to, to believe that this wasn't as serious, that we didn't need masks, we didn't need vaccines, we didn't need any of these things, we could gather, we could go to concerts, we could go to football games, then it became unpopular for legislators, even council members to stand up and oppose that and, 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 and question it. Because at that point, the, the community was divided so they have all chosen to to stay on the safe path. Don't say a word. Yeah, you get you get you know red hail. You get all these other issues that are one sided, 
yeah, people will stand up. They're going to all fight. But in this issue with COVID, because you got the power of the, you got the power of the, the, the lobbyists, the, the, the industries barking at these guys ears saying, hey, you cannot do that. We're going to lose money. We're going to lose money. They just took the safe path. And I will not vote for anyone that took the safe path. And I don't get to vote for many people, but collectively in this village, and I've said this before, it's up to this village to go out, find those candidates that are running that have a sincere desire to represent you as your and your community. Those are the ones are worthy of your vote. Plain and simple. You're right, Doc. It's gonna take. It, it's gonna have to be a reform. It's gonna have to be a change of the guard for anything to change. If not. You know, I, I was joking with my friend the other day. I said, I wish every year was an election year because look at all the goodies we're getting this year. Look at all the money that all of a sudden they found it because it's an election year, right? It's an election year. All of a sudden we're rich. Yeah, when it was an election, we were broke. We couldn't do this. We didn't have money. But election year, all of a sudden, who we found this influx of cash that we're going to give back to you. And, you know, this is not a... A, a, a subdivision or development of a hotel. No, this is a public health crisis, and people are dying. And and I want to I want to vote for a representative that's going to stand up for the community, and not just right take the safe path. Uh, and that's what we've seen. And and I'm very disappointed because I have many 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 friends. I don't know if they're my friends anymore, but I have a lot of friends in the legislature that have surprised me with their inaction, mm -hmm. with their silence. Mm -hmm. Uh, it just it just it baffles me, but it is what it is. It's politics, and uh, only only we, as the voters, can change can change that. So I have to vent, man, because it, it it is it's uh, I'm worried. And uh, anyway, Doc, any any closing thoughts before we head out, buddy? No, I think you wrapped it up great, Mel. Folks, thank you so much, Zach. You don't even know, man. I appreciate you for even going half an hour over. Um, I know our villagers appreciate you uh, whenever you get on, and and you know your your presentations are so clear and so uh, so straightforward. Uh, we all can understand. I think the graphics clearly show us uh, of the the situation that we are actually in. And I really wish the media would call you and get you on spotlight get you on a segment, um, you know, and they, they all watch this. I, you know, they used to take segments out and put it on the TV news. They don't do it anymore because it goes against the agenda that has been set forth by the industry. So we can only hope that our village, our villagers, our viewers, even the, the new ones that came on this, this uh, tonight, share it, hit the share button, get this thing out. It's on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever platform you're on, share it, get the word out. That's the only way the word is going to get to the, the policymakers. Whether they listen or not, we do our part and, and hope that they do theirs. With that, folks, thank you guys again. For thank another you, Mel. Great night. Uh, Doc, you stay safe. Keep up the good work. We'll definitely be in touch. And uh, we'll, we'll do this again soon, my friend. Thank you again, Mel, for everything you and Charlie are doing. Uh, you're welcome. Aloha.